Hey, what's going on everyone? Mecha here and you are watching another Fire Emblem archetype tier list. Today we're going to take a look at the Navars, the edgy swordsmen guys. And yes, I think this is an actual archetype. Not like the Gordons and the Drogas, or <laughs> the Drogas, the Dogas, that uh, feel like a very forced archetype. This is definitely a real thing. Um, obviously not all of them confirm to the same things, but generally they start out as red units, enemies that try to kill you, oftentimes with a killing edge, and you know, you have to talk to them to convince them to join you. That's usually how it goes. There are exceptions on this list for sure, but generally that's the way it goes. Um, if you have another archetype that you'd like me to take a look at, post them down in the comments below. There's plenty of them left, but for now we're gonna do these guys. So, in store for you today, I have got uh, the original Navar. There's three of them. Um, in fact, there's more than that. There's the FE11, which this one doesn't have a portrait of. Uh, this is the one from FE3, he's in both books. And then we got the one from FE11, Shadow Dragon, and the one from New Mystery. A mystery of the emblem and heroes of light and shadow <clears throat> then we got santo he is in both fe3 book 2 and in fe12 aka new mystery uh, we got dean he's in both echoes and gaiden but once again this game lacks portraits for gaiden uh, we got ira from fe4 um, shiva from fe5 i was about to say navar to him because he looks so much like him uh, trude from fe5 uh, rutger from fe6 fear from fe6 B e from FE7, and yes, that's how I pronounce it. Uh, Jafar from FE7, Joshua from FE8, Marissa from FE8, uh, Zyhark from FE9 and FE10, uh, Longku from Awakening, uh, Ryoma from Fates, uh, he's only in Birthright and Revelation, and then we got Felix from Three Houses. I thought those were the best fits. There's a couple more you could argue could fit in here. Um, I decided to focus on those that start as aligned as an enemy, so that pretty much covers all of these. Uh, Jafar is technically never your enemy in gameplay but he is in the story and since he's always using a killing edge and he fits some of the archetypes things better than Guy for example most of these are like an edgy kind of boys whereas he is just like kind of a noob <laughs> it's kind of a dumbass uh, but Jafar fits the archetype to a T in, the, in like every way other than the fact that he starts as a red unit but he's even like always wielding the killing edge when you see him in cutscenes so I thought it was fitting to have him here. Uh, Trude, I guess, also doesn't really necessarily fit it. He doesn't have or ever have a killing edge, but um, nonetheless, he starts as an enemy member down. And I thought it would be nice to have him here because no one ever talks about Trude. <laughs> so yeah, I thought it was a good excuse to put him in here. Uh, Marissa is like uh, Marissa and Fear are like the only girls on this list, from what I can tell. Uh, besides Ira, who doesn't really have a male equivalent in her game. Uh, but for some reason, the games that Marissa and um, Fear are in. For some reason they opted to like double up on the enemy Myrmidon with a strong killing sword thing. Like they don't actually have a killing edge, but they have the Jasham Seer or the Wo Dao, which are basically the same thing, but weaker with more crit. So I thought it was fitting. Uh Long Ku, he's never an enemy of yours. Neither is Radiant Dawn, Tai Hark, but I thought it'd be nice to have both FE9 and FE10 in here. Uh Long Ku is like he fits every single bit of the, of the Navarra archetype, except he's never an enemy. Uh Ryoma is your enemy in conquest, I guess, and sort of in Revelation. Uh, but I thought it was a good excuse to have a Fates character in here. I don't really know anything about the other Fates member downs because I've never really tried any of them besides Ryoma. And I have played Birthright, but I know how good he is. I have play I've played Planes of Revelation by now to realize just how good he is, so I thought he was a good fit. And I mean, Felix, like, Three Houses does recruitment so differently that you can't really have a Navarra archetype in there, but if there was one character that was based on the original Navarra, I think it'd be Felix. I mean, just look at the guy. He's basically the same thing. And he even has, even has a, like, a chance-based skill to deal extra damage, so... It can get more Navar than Felix in three houses, I feel like. So that's the collection of units I, I always decided to go with. Uh, Mia seems too different to have in here, so we'll have her on another list. This gives me a nice uh, two lines of characters to work with. Uh, I'm sorry if I can't fit every single archetype in here ever, but I don't know. This is just a group of characters I want to talk about today. But other characters will come up in the future. So let's start with uh, with Navar. Uh, FE1, FE3 Book 1, FE3 Book 2. Again, I haven't finished FE1 or FE3 Book 1, but I... I mean, I've, I've played enough up to a point. I like I've played up to Navar's recruitment for sure a little further ahead. Um, there's an interesting difference I think between FE1 and FE3 Navar. Uh, in FE3, you are forced to dismount when you're going indoors, and that makes other units worse, which comparatively makes Navar a little better in my opinion. Uh, the FE3 Book One the version of Navar uh, looks a lot better compared to like Abel and Kai and even Jaken, uh, because you'll have roughly their mobility, and uh, they don't just storm ahead of him and kill everything before he gets there. Which is a common trend with these units actually, is that they're all generally very fast and um, oftentimes their strength isn't even bad, sometimes it can be. Uh, 
and then they tend to rely on crits to kill, but sometimes they'll have like better means to kill than that. It really depends on the game. But their problem usually isn't their combat, but it's their lack of versatility and mobility that kind of does them in when it comes to tier lists like this. They will generally not be able to keep up with your multi units, you know, your your paladins and your flyers. They'll just be left in the dust, and they can usually fulfill tasks just fine on their own. The other problem with them is their lack of one to range. Uh, this is especially big in, for example, FE7, FE8, FE9, FE10, <laughs> where enemy on well, FE10 is not that big of an issue because it's I hard to use a wind edge. But generally, the problem is um, if an enemy is um, equipped with one to range, they just don't have an enemy face. They're almost as bad as an archer, basically. They can still attack them for sure, but they can't counterattack them on enemy face, and that gets really annoying in like FE7 in particular. So that's gonna hurt, for example, Gi quite a bit. And FE6 it doesn't matter as much because uh, one to range kind of sucks in that game, so. They'll get a free pass there, which is why Rutger is one of the best spoilers. Uh, but that tends to do them in for tier lists most of the time. Most casual players really love this archetype, I think. Because, well, first of all, they just look flashy as hell. Like, the crits, especially in the GBA games, are just super fun to watch. Uh, they usually have, like, quite overkill combat. This is one reason why Ira in particular is so beloved by a lot of players. Is she just cleans out the arena in such overkill fashion that you can't help but wonder how good she is. But FU4 in particular is also a game where mounts just race ahead of other units and kill things before she even gets there, so... That hurts. That, that hurts when it comes to a tier list that tries to judge units on your own. How much you help people complete the game, not just on a casual pace, but slightly faster as well. And that's what the, that's what gets these people down usually. Uh, don't get me wrong, there are some good units in here. There's some really good units in here, but most of the time I tend to find it hard to like rate these above like on average really because. Their speed tends to be a little overkill in a lot of games. In games where enemies are kind of easy to beat, uh, easy to double with most of your normal units, that's where they don't really shine in any way. Because if everyone doubles, then why is their own speed so good? The only other advantage they get out of their high speed is... Yeah, it's just their... Um, higher avoid, and that's not even that reliable in a lot of these games. It doesn't even really work, and even if it is the case, they usually are more fragile than other characters, so... Overall, when it comes to their defensive prowess and like their ability to survive on their own, they're not even that much better than other units, despite the higher avoid. So that kind of sets them back sometimes. But let's stop generalizing. Let's look at like how good Navar specifically is, because I was talking about him really, but I realized I wanted to talk about it a little more in general before I was going to say it separately for each of these characters. So that really helps the dismounting thing. That helps FE3 uh, Navar a bit, I think. FE3 Book Two, he has the same um, boon, I guess, is that other characters are often forced to dismount. So that makes Navar a little better. Uh, fun fact, in FE1 and FE3, there's actually no Swordmaster class, no Myrmidon class either. Uh, he and uh, Ogma are the same class, they're the Mercenary class, which promotes the hero. But hero only uses swords in that game. So it's kind of like a breed between Swordmaster and hero. I don't think, yeah, Swordmaster doesn't really have a crit bonus or anything, so it's just like a generic sword dude. Uh, overall, if you were to like, mix like FE1 and FE3 Navar in here, I think you'd end up around here somewhere, or like maybe, maybe here. Uh, depends. He's not like very standout. It's kind of hard to, you know, just squeeze three Navar ratings into one. So this is where I probably end up. Uh, maybe the FE three book two version is like more up here. I really liked him when I used him. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but wyverns are particularly broken in that game. He gets so many of them that it's hard to like really see him come into his own. But he's a decent combat unit, all right. He's like all right. I'd say he's like roughly like maybe between like B tier and C tier, honestly. Um, I'll just be nice and put him like a B tier and then probably put some other units over him. And we got Shadow Dragon Navar, uh, probably his worst incarnation. So I've talked a lot before about the Arcanea games, about the Arcanea and 3DS games, and how characters can, or the DS games, excuse me, and how they can reclass in those games. And that, you know, that makes it kind of annoying to rate them for this tier, for this tier list. Because on one hand, you know, I want to rate them as Swordmasters, I want to compare everyone as if they're playing as a Swordmaster. But on the other hand, I think it's just such a huge part of the game, and especially a huge part of any character that they can reclass and you know be a specialized unit. Now for Navar, I think it really makes much of a difference because I think his best bet, no matter what the difficulty is, is just to stay in his base class as a Myrmidon. But he's kind of bad in that class even. There's like two good reclass options for him overall, like two good class options total. One of his base class and the other one in that game is to reclass with the Cavalier. And the big problem for him in Cavalier, especially hard five, is his speed is actually bad, which is very surprising. This is Navar we're talking about, but his speed is actually awful. The reason that is is because um, his, his, his speed when he when he joins you is pretty good, but it's actually not because of his personal speed. Like it's not because Navar is fast; it's just because the Myrmidon class is fast. And when you get him out of that Myrmidon class into another class, his speed is garbage. <laughs> it's absolute garbage. So you reclass with the Cavalier and you play on like hard five merciless mode, and he just gets doubled on one round. Like in chapter four, the chapter after he joins, it's quite insane how fast that can go. 
Uh, I think maybe if he uses a sword, he doesn't get double, but when he uses a lance, he definitely does. Uh, and that's sad, because Cavalier and Myrmidon are the only classes where he can use his high sword rank. If we were to reclass him to, say, Archer, he would just have an e rank bows and terrible stats. Uh, reclass him to, like, anything else, and he's still gonna be bad. Again, to promotion, he can, like, reclass the Sniper or Swordmaster, or be those classes and be just fine, but in Shadow Dragon, you generally don't really have a point to that. Another problem for Navarre in Shadow Dragon is just there's too many enemy lance users, and swords are just very bad in that game because the weapon triangle is so impactful in your combat, you get less might. Um, the, the one big boon for swords is that they get extra might as they grow in level and uh, in weapon rank. Like uh, C rank, you get plus one might, D beam rank, you get plus two, A rank, you get plus three, but that bonus is negated if the enemy has weapon triangle over you. So he negates that bonus for himself whenever he's fighting anything with a lance, which is so many enemies in that game. He's really only good at like, attacking archers, which is something anyone can do just fine. So it's not like there's a huge need for him. So I think he's one of the worst of these, actually, even with reclass and taken into, taken into account. FE12 Navarre has a lot of the same problems, but in FE12 he has a lot more freedom when it comes to reclassing. Uh, in that game, you can not only reclass to, say, Swordmaster or Sniper after promotion, or even before promotion, actually, you still get open class options, because in FE12 any male character can become anything as long as you've beaten the game once. You can reclass to almost any class. So you can make him into like a horseman uh, after promotion. You can make him into, well, a, a paladin. I guess you could already do that. Uh, he can become a, uh, a wyvern rider if you want him to be. So he has a lot of options open to him. Now, that goes for any male character, so it doesn't make him a whole lot better compared to the other 12 cast, but I think it makes him a, a fair bit better to point him like here, or even here. Uh, I think, in fact, I would say he might even be better than uh, FE 3 Book 2 Navarre, uh, when you take all that into account. I've seen him used effectively. He can work quite well. His bases are fairly decent in that game. Like in, a, in like the Shadow Dragon games and FE 1 games, FE 3 Book 1, He's just, uh, he's a Myrmidon who joins early, so you have to like put a lot of work into him to train him up. But in FE3 Book 2, he joins like when you're about to head into the mid game, basically, is what I would call it. It's like chapter 6 or so. It, it sounds very early, but that game is, is kind of different in the way that the chapters work. It's like it gets out of the early game very quick. Um, there's not much room to train, but he joins at a pretty serviceable level, I find. It depends on the difficulty, of course. I haven't played FE12 at like very high levels, so. But I know we can work in that game. His growths are on par with the rest of the cast and stuff. So he can he can work quite well and he's pretty fast. He's pretty nice. Uh, but really his main selling point compared to other characters is his high sword rank. And uh, in FE12 he's a lot better off with that. Because FE12 has a lot more different enemy types. A lot of dragons to fight that he keeps worm slayers against. So those are some good reasons to use Navarre. And then we got Santo who's like uh, Navarre but worse in FE3 Book 2. And the same goes for FE12. Uh, he's pretty garbage. He actually imitates Navarre when he when you first see him. He's in like um, actually it's like chapter six where he joins. Navarre's chapter seven. I got that mixed up earlier. Uh, Santo is like he looks like Navarre when you recruit him, but when you when you recruit him, he turns into himself. Uh, but he still can use the killing edge, which is okay. But in general, he's just the worst version of Navarre. I would put both of his versions around here somewhere probably. He's um, yeah, he's not that good. <laughs> he's I mean his, his stats are just bad. He just has bad base stats. Really, that's the main problem with him. Uh, then we got Dean, he's in both Echoes and uh, Gaiden, and there's no Gaiden Sprite. So I like Dean a lot, I think the only the biggest knock on him is his availability. He can be recruited in Part 3, late Part 3. Uh, I'm gonna take a moment to compare it to Sonia, who is like the other alternate character. He's like basically a route split in that game. Uh, you can either um, kill Dean and then you get Sonia, or you can kill Sonia and get Dean. You can like pick a map where you kill one of them. And a lot of people think and probably thought and probably still think that Sonya is the better choice because I don't know titties I guess I don't know I, I've always found that a very easy choice for Dean uh, Sonya is very defensively frail I don't think she has many spell options unless you like level up a whole lot whereas Dean is just really good at base level already he joins five level away from the broken dreadfighter class which is so mobile in Gaiden in a game where you really need mobility uh, like in that game your high mobility options are you get like Pala and an Est. Uh, well, Est, I guess, has high mobility, but not a whole lot of other things. They get like Pala and Katria for high mobility, and everyone else is just like left in the dust, basically. Everyone else falls behind all Celica's maps. But Dean is pretty close to being a Dread Fighter. And Dread Fighter is just a broken class. It has really high magic resistance, um, which is another rarity in that game. Like, you fight so many magic enemies, but almost none of your units have like any resistance to speak of. And um, Dread Fighter solves that. It's really good against magic enemies in both. Guide and, and an Echoes, and he can use a bunch of good swords. He comes with like a good sword. I think he's, his core sword is called the Brave Sword in that game. And it's not like the other games where it just hits four times. He just has a high crit rate. It's like a killing edge basically, which is another reason I felt comfortable putting him on here. But 
Uh, I don't use this can use it too, so it's not big a boon, not, not that big of a boon for him. But at the same time, uh, there's probably some good sword you can give him. He, he competes with like uh, Kamui and Saber for the good swords, but there's probably something you, you can you can give him. So I would honestly put him like around here somewhere. Um, I think he's actually like upper B tier probably. Um, I could knock him a little harder for his low, low, lack of availability, but honestly, he's so good when he joins that I don't really mind him being up there. I think he's like. Almost like a pent level pre promote with how, how strong he is. He's not invincible, don't get me wrong, but he's very, very nice to have. And I think a lot easier to maintain than Sonya is. So then we got Ira, and she embodies what people love about Myrmidons and what people don't like about Myrmidons, depending on who you're asking. So Ira joins very early in chapter one, and you recruit her by seizing her castle and talking to her with Sigurd. And she doesn't have a killing edge, I know, but no one has a killing edge in the game because it doesn't exist. But she does have uh, Astra, which is basically the same thing as a Killing Edge when it comes to fighting her. It's like she has a chance to crit you, so you better be careful. But recruiting her can be kind of tricky. And I mean, you don't talk to her with, you know, enough, uh, someone like a cleric or whatever. And I think most of the. Like, she fits the archetype the best other than maybe Jamka. But the problem with Jamka is that he's so different from the other characters here in a lot of other ways. Like, he uses bows instead of swords. And I already rated Jamka in the Archer video, so I felt this is the best chance I have to talk about Ira. So I think Ira is closer to a Navar than anyone else here. Or rather than uh, than Jamka is. But I think combined they kind of make for the Jamka archetype, right? Or the, the Navar archetype when you think about it. Because Jamka actually does come with like the only killer weapon in the game. So uh, Ira, she um, she relies on Astra to kill early on. She doesn't actually do with Theo anything. Uh, and a lot of your characters actually do that on their own. So she doesn't really stand out in that way. Like someone like Alec can already two round most of the bandits when you're know when she joins so she doesn't really stand out unless she gets Astra which is luck based you can't rely on it so it's not very good and then big problem with Ira really is genealogy is just so mount based you can use your unbound units don't get me wrong and they won't be like bad or anything if you're playing slowly enough but mounted units are so so much better at killing enemies sooner than unmounted units are they they're just infinitely more flexible the fact that they have more movements on top of road tiles that give them even more of a movement advantage and the fact that you often walk through like empty patches of you know land with no enemies on them means to get such a huge head start that amount units just cannot keep up generally. Doesn't mean that Ira isn't good for anything. You can send her off on her own somewhere else along with some backup, and then she can probably get the job done there. But then she probably needs some time to return there, or someone needs to come and retrieve her with like a return staff or something. You kind of have to go out of your way to make use of Ira. You have to slow yourself down to make use of Ira, and she can't really survive on her own. Uh, her durability isn't very good, and dodging is not a very reliable strategy for her in FE4. Not before promotion, anyway. I know that after promotion, she actually becomes really good. Um, almost any, anyone becomes good after promotion, but Ira really stands out in her own way. She gets Adepts, which she didn't have before. And she, like almost anyone else, has a good promotion bonus. I think she gets like 5 speed on promotion or something. Um, she, she does clear the arena, but I think almost anyone in FE4 can clear the arena, given enough, um, like, given the right items, given the right tools. So I don't think that's a huge standout trait for her. Like I like using Ara for fun, but I don't think she's very good. I don't think she really holds up when you're comparing. Like I think all mount units in FP4 are pretty much better than Ara. And I know that sounds strange that someone like Alec could sound like they're better than Ira. But when you think about it, if you don't if you don't slow down for Ira, what is she gonna do on the map? She's not gonna do anything. So you have to hold your whole army back just to accommodate Ira, just so she can do anything. That doesn't seem very good to me. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna put it like around here. Uh, I don't think she's as bad as Samto, not anywhere near that bad. Uh, she's quite salvageable, like she's not bad at combat, she's just bad at getting into combat and then when she gets in combat, she's not even that great at it. She's like slightly better than your you know, average mount unit at it. Not great, it's, she's okay. Uh, then we got the Kai, I just kind of called Navar because he just, I mean, just compare their pork exhibit, just look at him, he's just so similar. Uh, but this is Shiva from Fire Emblem 5, 3776. And he's very traditional, he has relationships to both Lithus, a thief, and um, what's her face, Safi? Uh, maybe I think she's like Safi in Project Exile, so and a cleric, so it's a very traditional Navar style things. I don't really get what his relationship is to Safi, he just kind of tells Lithus to like keep his hands off her, but he doesn't really talk to her ever again other than that recruitment convo. Uh, but, you know, he's, a, he's the Navar of the game for sure, he even has the killing edge, I don't know why I'm justifying this. Uh, a lot of people like to capture him in the Guiding chapter you first see him in to get his Killing Edge. I think that's a huge pain in the butt and I would never bother doing that because, I mean, just trying to capture him on a fort that gives him plus 10 defense while you're having the character's 
capturing characters defense um, offenses through capturing is just so bad and annoying and every turn you're trying you're risking yourself getting crit unless you trade yourself to scroll which a lot of people don't even do i think they just risk it and it's kind of safe state until they get killing edge which is very risky and very bad but you can do it i guess Anyway, uh, his performance, he's uh, he's okay. FE5 is another game where you can dismount indoors, where you have to dismount indoors. So that gives him a bit of an edge that, for example, Ira, there's no indoor maps where Ira and her friends have to dismount. So she's always going to be in a move disadvantage. But Shiva is completely fine in that regard. He can have more mobility than most people like. If, if you put Shiva indoors, he has six move in his upper motor class and then seven as a swordmaster. Whereas um, Ira is always facing like a... I can move to disadvantage and then like Shiva's peers like his, his dismounted peers his unpromoted peers they have like five move indoors so Shiva's definitely has a mobility advantage in some cases which helps um one problem with Thracia I guess is that Shiva doesn't have one to range as much as um say mages do but compared to other physical units he's not even that bad off uh, he can use thunder fire or even wind swords somewhat effectively his magic is kind of low but you get those swords quite early for the most part except the wind sword and he has a really high critical rate thanks to his high pursuit critical. I think he has, I think he has four or five. I'm not sure, but he has like a lot of crit, and he has a support with Safi that can boost it by like basically that much. Like um, Safi gives him 10% crit, and on his second hit, if his pursuit critical is five, which I believe it is, then he gets plus 50% crit, which is insane. And with the killing edge, he just has 100% period on second hit, but we can one round enemies when he needs to. And that also helps when using magic swords. If you use the thunder sword, for example, you will get plus five skill. That can be plus 25% critical. So that is very good. So Shifa combat wise, no problems. Uh, the, the magic swords are kind of rare and there's more people who want them, but he has a high sword rank that a lot of people can't really match. And some there are some good sword users in Thracia, but a lot of them have their personal swords. Uh, Leaf and Nana both have their own personal swords. So they're not really wanting of a magic sword. So he's a good candidate for them. I like him. So I think Shiva's okay at combat. The problem with Thracia with Shiva, I think, is that there's just not that much combat to be done, period. And Shiva doesn't have a lot of utility outside of combat. Like some people can capture or use stabs or dance or pick locks or steal. But Shiva can't really do anything of that. So whenever there's like a utility-based chapter where you're doing something other than just killing a lot of enemies, Shiva isn't very good. And I think while Shiva's combat is like decent and up to par, it's not as great as some of your audience uh, combat stats probably are. Um, like, I don't think his stats are as good as, for example, Dean's or Ralph or Orson or Asphel. Like, those those are some insanely powerful units with, like, uh, some of them even have good one to range, like Asphel and Orson. Shiva's one to range is okay. So I think Shiva's like a decent combat unit that can hold his own, but I wouldn't put him like any higher than this. I mean, I'm, I'd probably put him like over the Navars probably. I'm more familiar with Shiva than the Navar, I will admit, uh, but Shiva strikes me as a bit better. It does have Soul, which a lot of people really like. It's like this thing that like it looks like a very effective skill because whenever he, it's like a good effect you heal hp whenever you hit someone with the skill activated but i think whenever if, if soul saves you from dying which i think is the main thing it, it should be praised for then you didn't really play the game well i think i think if, if soul saves you from dying you probably shouldn't have put that character in that position to begin with because if you didn't activate soul he would have died so you're relying on luck to survive which i think is a bad idea in a strategy game so for that reason, I really give a whole lot of credit to Soul. Unless you're like fighting a ton of enemies and Shiva is dying in some number of hits, but in order for him to die, like all enemies have to hit him or almost all of them have to hit him. In that case, Soul can act as like an extra cushion. And I pronounce it, I always mispronounce at least one word in these videos. Uh, but it can add, a, it, it can add like an extra check that enemies have to go through. It's like, okay, not only do we have to hit Shiva every single time, but we also have him to have, to have him not activate Soul. And the skill is pretty good and it's skill percent so if his skill is like 15 and every every time he hits someone he's like a 15 percent chance to hit him with a soul and every time he heals himself through soul that's like another hit negated so that can be pretty good in the long run but if there's like three enemies that can kill him in range uh, in like two hits something like soul is not something you should rely on so next on the list i have trude from uh, the same game actually fire Emblem 5 3 6, 7, 7, 6. i think a lot of people miss this guy on the first playthrough if they're playing blind because he's running around in the fog of war map and if you don't you know complete the objective that you're supposed to complete i'm not going to spoil it because Thracia has a great game to play blind and i think a lot of people haven't played it um but if you don't complete like the certain side objective and then do a certain thing to make sure that he doesn't escape the map then uh, you're just not going to get him generally. He's kind of hard to recruit blindly. So a lot of people miss out on him. And to be honest, you're not missing out on a whole lot. 
I think Tarun is actually very interesting because he makes battles less interesting. Uh, his niche is that he has a skill called Nihil that negates all skills in battle, all enemy skills. And that's not very useful in Thracia overall, because in Thracia most enemies don't have skills and you don't even fight that much, like I said in Shiva's uh, review. So it doesn't really do very much special. He does have a very high sword rank of B. He used the silver sword at base, and that kind of let him run around some pretty good, like a pretty good portion of the enemies. But as I said, Thracia is not very combat based overall, and especially after True joins, there's not a whole lot of opportunities for him to like flex his muscles and train up. There's chapter 14, the defense chapter, where he can get quite a couple of kills if he wanted to. But there's not a whole lot of True fans out there who've done that, I feel like. So I don't think True is like a super great candidate for training. There's like a lot of people you might want to train instead. Like around that time, you have Marita, you have Homer, uh, you might want to train Edda because you like her. Uh, there's like a lot of candidates for people for like, and there's like Lanoan well, too. So there's a lot of people that people want to train, and True just doesn't really, I mean, he's not a very sexy guy or anything. <laughs> so I don't think people really like him very much. I, like, every time I Iron Man through Thracia, which I've done quite a lot, I always feel like I want to use True this time, because I've never trained him for, like, the whole game as, like, a proper team member. And I always feel like, you know, I wanted to use True, and then, like, three chapters, I just kind of forget about him or don't want to deploy him anymore, because I just, I don't really have a reason to deploy him over my audience. He's just not that great at, like anything other than combat and as I said combat is not that useful in Thracia so I still think Trude is like the same tier as Shiva overall like maybe a little worse um I, I'm, I'm, if, I think if I put him over Ira people would get very mad at me um but I think you could make a good case that Trude is better than Ira actually but for now I'm gonna put him around here somewhere now Rutger, this is a really good unit. This is one of the best units in FE6. I think you could argue he's the best unit in FE6. Uh, FE6 is like the most balanced top tier of all games overall, I feel like. Because it doesn't have a pre-promote that just breaks the game for the complete duration of the game. Like Marcus, definitely it becomes a lot worse relatively to your other characters as the game goes along. And um, it, you also get a really good flyer in the mid game, a lady. And that just means that like Rutger is like falls kind of in between him. He like he joins early on like that flyer, but he's really really good at combat. He doubles and kills everything. Whereas Milady, she doubles and kills most things, but she does have her weaknesses like her low resistance, and uh, she's not as good at boss killing him as Rutger is. And also Rutger is just available for like the whole game basically, and that makes him so good. Um, FE6 is a game where all the swordmaster traits that I named, uh, being fast and also being accurate, something I haven't really discussed a lot. Uh, for the most part, you can kind of take that for granted with Fire Emblem characters, the fact that they double and that they are accurate. Um, at least in these old school games, generally the character's speed doesn't really matter that much for doubling, almost everyone double attacks enemies anyway. In FE6, that's not a given, and the same goes for accuracy. You can kind of expect characters to just hit their targets most reliably, but in FE6, character accuracy is like at an all-time low. Except maybe in Thracia in some cases. But Rutger being accurate and then like, just hitting stuff twice is just such a good asset in FE6. And then there's also the fact that javelins and hand nexus in FE6 are notoriously accurate. So the biggest advantage that other units have over sword units in FE7 and FE8 and FE9 is just not there in FE6. So that makes Rutger relatively much better as a memory dump. And then of course, the reason everyone knows is that sword masters get a 30% crit bonus in FE6 compared to later games where they get a lower amount. Uh, usually in the GBA games, it's like 15. So Rutger just becomes relatively much better than his peers. So much better. And a lot of people rave on about Rutger's Harpoon bonus is also helping. That helps, but I think all these other factors are more important. But the fact that he has Harpoon bonuses, of course, is uh, is nice. It, it gives him a little bit of an extra statistical edge. But even in normal mode, the speed is uh, quite a bit higher than most people. So I think Rutger is an easy S tier. And uh, I would never dream of putting him any lower. I definitely think there's a tier between him and these other guys in here. Um, like, you might you might be surprised that I'm not penalizing him for being an unmounted unit. And again, it does have some good mounted units, but the thing is... Rutger is so much better at combat in a game where that edge in combat actually comes out quite a bit. It's actually being utilized quite a bit, makes a huge difference in how you want to play the game. So I really think that Rutger's extra combat is worth being up here. I think he's a better unit than almost all the amount of units in that game. I think you could argue that uh, Marcus is better early on. I think you can argue that Milady is more useful and better when she joins. But the fact that Rutger is good for the whole game compared to those two is... You know a good reason to put him as the best unit in FE6, arguably. He definitely saved my Iron Man a couple times, for sure. 
Alright, next up we got Fear from the same game, Fire Emblem 6. And Fear has all the same advantages of a Swordmaster. The problem she has compared to Rutger is that she joins in chapter, let me think, chapter 9, compared to his chapter 4. And then she's also very on a level. She joins at level 1, <laughs> compared to Rutger, who joins at level 4. But let's forget about Rutger for a moment, because pretty much every unit in FE6 loses a comparison to Rutger. But what we really care about here is how good Fear is in FE6. And I think Fear is actually pretty decent. Uh, she has all the same perks that the other Swordmasters do, it's just she comes on a level, but doesn't come underpowered, and I think people often look at the character's level too much when they're trying to decide if a character is worth using if they're underleveled. Like, it implies they have some kind of a disadvantage against enemies, but I think it's important to look at how they're performing against enemies before you judge that, because if they do fine against enemies at their base level, then really the, the, all the level is is an indication that they're going to get a lot of XP for kills and chipping. So, um, sure, in the case of Fear, she will probably perform worse than some of your better units. You'll probably perform worse than, again, than your better units against pirates, especially when it comes to durability. She is pretty fragile when she joins, but her offense, I think, is quite decent. She has around 9 to 10 strength on hard mode, I believe, and then like good enough speed to double with anything but like a steel sword or something. Uh, but with the Wo Dao or the Iron Sword, she will double, no problem. And her damage is like decent enough to where she can two round in combination with someone else. So she's quite easy to train up. Now her strength growth isn't very good, but her base is relatively good for a level to the point where I would say her strength is okay. It's not great, but it's not bad either, and her speed is still great. And like I said with Rutger, just hitting twice and um, critting a lot gets you pretty far in FE6. He can, just, he can be a good boss killer, not as good as Rutger, but still pretty good. Like, I'm trying not to compare her to Rutger too much, because really, on her own right, she's a decent unit. Not amazing, but I think she has her own niche. Uh, I don't know if I'd say she's better than Dean, because the Dreadfighter class is really, like, super useful. But I think Fear has an easier place, uh, it's like a better argument for being on a team in FE6 than, um, than these other guys have in their own games. I think Fear is a pretty goddamn okay unit. <laughs> pretty goddamn okay. I mean, you know what I mean? Just sword masses are just good. Like, she gets that 30% crit bonus in FE6, it's so welcome. Uh, she has super high speed that lets her double even enemy mercenaries and enemy, mur enemy myrmidons at some points. That's really good. He's just fantastic in that regard. And um, I don't really like to talk about supports very much because they're so slow in the GBA games. Uh, but if you're playing with supports on, I do like that she has a relatively fast support with Shin. And that gives her some good bonuses. I believe she has like a fire affinity and Shin is like ice or dark, I believe. So that's some avoid that you can get that can also be pretty nice. That's the reason that a lot of people like Rutger. So I just think it's a fair thing to bring up for Fear. Let me just double check that the abilities are, that the affinities are correct though. Yeah, so Fear is fire and Shin is ice. So they get full avoid from that. Uh, not full crit or uh, full attack, unfortunately, but still pretty good support overall. Although, actually, it, it grows pretty slow and uh, it has a 1 base and 2 growth, so it's not that fast as I was hoping for. But it's it's still an option, I guess, if you're okay with support I'm using. But even without that support, I would still consider it roughly this good. And we got Gi. Uh, I'll just like briefly elaborate why I pronounce it like that. So, I pronounce it this way because Don Don taught me to pronounce it that way. And Dandan Dan usually reads these names in Japanese before he checks their pronunciation. And if you look at uh, the Fire Emblem Wiki, a good one, it actually says his name in Japanese. And it's it's written like G-I-I -I as the original romanticization, I think is what it's called, romanticization, whatever. And I actually had Soen check it for me, and she's like not a native uh, Jap Japanese speaker, but she actually studies Japanese. And uh, she also says it's written like that and pronounced like that. So I'm going to take her word for it, pronounce it as Gi. I know it's very, it's very tempting to just pronounce it as guy because that's a word in English. But as far as I know, it's Gi, and that's just what I'm going to be used to. And Gi's alright. I don't think he's great though. I, th I think Gi has a lot of the same issues that Ira has, except that he's also in a game where javelins and hand axes are such important assets to units to functional enemy phase. Like FE7 and FE8 just have a lot of enemies that are very weak, but that you can one round with a javelin and a hand axe. And if you can't do that on enemy phase, they're just like basically like an archer, and that's super, super annoying to work with. And his e speed is complete overkill. Enemies are not slow enough to not get doubled by, like even Lowen and even Osman. Slow units like that can double in FE7 every now and then. Not everything, but enough. And then even if they can double, they are still more productive against than Gi against like a, a weak mage or some kind of soldier with a javelin or, you know, stuff like that. They're they're too weak. But if you look at the map, like the the pirate ship with all the shamans. He on enemy phase is a complete sitting duck, like every shaman is just gonna hit him from true range until he dies. Whereas if I put someone like Oswin in there, you know, he, he might take some damage, but he's also gonna just... You can either want to KO him if it's like a low difficulty, 
or he can at least tooth kill them and he can like you soften them up for someone else to kill at least that's good that's helpful he isn't doing anything in enemy phase also fe7 and uh, fe8 just have a lot of enemy lance users and weapon triangle perpetual weapon triangle it cuts into his damage which is already very limited because all these units have some level of strength issues but Gi definitely has some strength issues i know he gets harbor bonuses but those don't fix and those don't make him tooth kill enemies unless he's using like a uh, he's, he's critting with the killing edge, or he has like his like steel blade, which weighs him too much down too much to like tooth kill. He generally isn't one round killing without a crit a lot of the time, uh, unless it's like a particularly weak enemy, like maybe a mage or something. So that kind of sucks. And then like even further decreasing his power because of weapon triangle advantage, and then also um, the enemy just has a higher chance to hit him, which cuts into his avoid advantage. All that shit doesn't help. <laughs> it really doesn't help. So, Gi being a sudden duck on most enemy faces, I would actually put him like maybe here, but honestly, I put him around here. I really don't think he's that great. The availability and like he has some early game utility. Like when he, when he joins that early on, he has some time where you don't really have a lot of alternative options to use him. Another thing I don't really like about Gi, although that's more like a personal preference or like a, a weird thing, uh, there's like one chapter in FE7 where uh, the game kind of decides for you which path you're gonna go. It's like a route split, a mini route split. Uh, either you're going to go to the Kenneth version or the Jeremy version, and the Kenneth version, you go to that if your Guiding Ring users minus Kanas are at a higher number of XP than your um, Hero Crest users like Gi, Dorcas, Raven, Bartry. The game adds up the XP gained by them in Hector Hard mode or whatever mode you have to be playing, but not lit mode. And it's like, okay, if if, if you if your Hero Crest users have gained more XP, then you go to Jeremy. If, you, if your Guiding Ring users have gained more XP, you go into Kenneth. And uh, the Kenneth version is perhaps preferable because it's uh, it's seas instead of routes, and you have to face the snow less, so your mobility is less limited. Whereas the Jeremy version, it's just horrendous. It sucks. It's such a pain to play. Now, I'm not gonna hold this against Gi because it is just a route split. It's just one chapter, and I don't even know if it's like a valid criterion to like put him lower because of one chapter route split. But it is one reason I don't like using Gi <laughs> for personal reasons, though. I just thought I'd bring it up as like an Easter egg. Now uh, we got Jafar. Uh, again, kind of a weird inclusion into the list, but uh, I think he fits the archetype to a T for the most part. And uh, I think Jafar is actually really damn good <laughs> in uh, late game. Uh, again, just like Dean, the only thing really wrong with him is that he joins so late. And uh, I mean, the lack of 2 range still hurts, don't get me wrong, but Jafar joins at just the right time before Cog of Destiny and Hector Hard Mode. And I'm judging these units on the highest difficulty setting generally. And Hector Hard Mode means that Cog of Destiny is filled with 1 2 range enemies, but a lot of them are Valkyries. In fact, if you're facing the reinforcements, you're facing a lot of Valkyries. And those are very tough to kill for most of your general units. Like, for most of the game, a unit like Heath, or um, say Hawkeye, or Geats, or Oswin, they will do fine against most enemy types. Even though their res isn't too great and their speed isn't too great, they have the tools to take care of most enemies. But Kaka Destiny kind of turns around, throws a bunch of magic enemies at you, and suddenly resistance becomes kind of important. And against Valkyrie, speed becomes kind of important because they have, I think, around 17 to 22 speed. So they will double you. They'll double someone like Oswin, they'll double someone like Geats or Hawkeye quite easily. And they can pure water to mitigate the damage a little bit, but their offense is gonna suck. Because they need to Brave Axe on, any, on like player phase or like Brave Lance or something like that. And uh, hopefully they hit. Or they need to like one to range them on enemy phase and they won't double. And um, the enemies might heal themselves because the Valkyries all have like physics stabs and shit. It's very annoying. So you're up the creek without a paddle, without a good way to just one round these Valkyries. And that's what Jafar can do. You can double them at base level. It's like 24 base speed, which is insane. But you can double all with, with like the fastest ones. And even some of the fastest ones, they weigh themselves down with L fire. So Jafar has a good niche where he can kill enemies. And it's kind of similar to what Rutger does in FE6. He has high enough speed to double and enough to attack to tooth Kyo. And he has high accuracy against the enemy with higher void. Like one of the things that made Rutger really good is for boss killing is that he just doesn't care as much about the throne bonuses that uh, FE6 likes to give to his bosses. They get like 30, 30 extra void. It's kind of like what the Valkyries have and uh, kind of like a throne on themselves because they're so dodgy. That's what makes Jafar really good in that area. I still don't think he's as great as like Fear is, for example. Uh, I think like you could argue like anyone with some semblance of ability is, is like better than him. But I do like Jafar's fighting powers a lot. I like him a lot more better than like Ira, who for me doesn't really do anything that I can't really get done with anyone else. I think Jafar has a much better niche. Um, Joshua and Marissa have the same problem that uh, Guy had, where Mervinazis aren't very good in that game. 
because you know you need one to range more than you need overkill speed and the extra void doesn't really help your durability very much fe8 is less heavy on lances than fe7 but it still has lances as like most common enemy types so the same problem still plagues joshua just to a lesser extent i think joshua's strength is a bit more salvageable than gi in context of his game and i think there's a bit more enemies that the speed is useful against so i, I would put joshua a little bit higher I would even put him over Ira. I think Joshua has some decent early game utility for the most part. I wanted to use him in my current Iron Man run, but the problem I'm finding uh, is because like in my FE8 Iron Man run right now, I increased the enemy growth by 30%, so everything is very different. Uh, all the enemies are quite a bit stronger, but I, there's just so many other units I want to use in the Iron Man run. Uh, I want to use like, and I hate him saying this, but I'm using like Ford and Amelia just as memes and to, like to prove the chat that they're bad, basically. And... Um, that left no room for Joshua, which is just which sucks because I was really looking forward to using him again because he's he's fun to use. But like, try deploying Joshua on like the ghost ship. I don't know why I keep using like ships, ship like boat maps as as like examples. But Joshua on that ship is just a sitting duck against most enemies. The only enemies he counters are those enemies that have like that die to everything, like those those entombed and those uh, renovants. Those anyone can kill, so not really very special for Joshua to fight them. But then if a mogul flies up to him, it's gonna go uncountered. If a uh, Gargoyle with a javelin flies up to him, or like even a gargoyle in general is just kind of good against Joshua. Because he faces Weapon Triangle disadvantage, uh, does quite a bit of damage to him. Uh, very accurate against him because of the Weapon Triangle. He's just very bad against like almost every enemy type there. He's very bad against the boss too. I mean, it's, it's not good in those situations, really not. And like that goes for almost any situation where monsters are involved. But even you and enemies with like javelins and like mages, all those make Joshua look bad because he's not productive in enemy phase. And that sucks. If he ate, he wouldn't be productive in enemy phase. Marissa has all the same problems, and then she's also really underpowered when she joins. I say underpowered on purpose because I just ranked it about like unlevelledness in FE8 in um, Fire Emblem in general. But Marissa and Fear are not comparable at all. Like Fear joins and she's reasonably competent against the enemies she fights against, and she has a niche in the same way that Rutger does, where she's just good against you know she just has the right stats for the enemies. Marissa joins with poor stats for her joining time. Like she joins at level five with stats worse than Joshua, but like seven chapters later so it's she's much worse i would say she's an e tier easily quite easily doesn't mean she can't be good though like fe8 gives you enough time to train her up if you really want to even in the normal chapters if you don't like that you can also train her at the tower of phone if you want to but i'm not taking grinding into account in fe8 because grinding turns the game well it, it the game isn't balanced around grinding really uh some characters i mean you could argue that marissa was put in the position she did because you had the option to grind her but I find that grinding ruins the game experience and I try to keep it out of Fire Emblem because if I can grind Marissa then where is it gonna end? Like I could also grind up my other characters, make them invincible basically. Um so for the playstyle I'm judging them by, grinding is just not an option. Um but you could make a rule set for a tier list where characters are allowed to be grinded up to like your average party level. Like let's say your character's all around level 15 at that point, and you say like okay, Marissa joins at level 5, so I'm gonna grind her 10 levels and I'm gonna stop. That's fine if that's your playstyle, but that's not the one I'm using for this one. So, with those parameters, Marissa has an ET. I mean, you got Zyhark from FE9. Now, FE9 is a game I've only played like twice or three times. Uh, I've, I've, I've watched Manx plays it on, uh, play it on Maniac mode. Uh, that's the only Japanese version. Uh, Zyhark is a unit I don't really like very much in FE9, because it does have the same weak enemies that FE8 and FE7 have, mostly. Uh, a little more variety, I guess, enemy stat-wise, but for the most part, you want to have one to range. Especially in, in Maniac mode, actually, there was a lot of one to range that Zyhark will never counter. Uh, I don't think there's like any good one to range swords in, um, in, in Path of Range, but even in like the super easy English version where there's no Maniac mode, Zyhark just doesn't have any reasons to stand out. Like, all the reasons to use Rutger in FE6 just don't apply to FE6. Or just don't apply to FE9. They just they just don't work for him, and that makes Cyhart quite poor. He does have Adapt, which is cool. Uh, FE9 doesn't really let you swap skills around like FE10 does, so that Adapt skill is very nice for Cyhart, and only he can use it. If you take it off, him, no one else is going to get it. So it is quite good, but he doesn't like it, it. Doesn't really help him very much. Like it's still too weak to two hit kill most of the time, from what I remember. And again, almost everyone else can double too. Like. Even Ike, who doesn't have like standout speed, just good speed in general. Or like Kieran, Oscar, etc. Those units have less speed than Zyhark on average, but they all still double. So the speed he has is quite overkill. And um, that's his most standout stat. Like, again, his skill is high, but everyone else is pretty reliable at hitting too. So I don't think there's much of a point in Zyhark. Like, you wish he could give him like a Forged Javelin or a Forged Handaxe to have him kill enemies, but he just can't. 
So I think that's gonna end up like around East tier, maybe even a little bit lower than that. It, it looks very low for him. I, th I still think he's competent. You can give him bonus experience and everything, he'll be decent. I think maybe he's like around Joshua's level, maybe. Uh, like around here somewhere, I think would be reasonable. So we'll put him here for now. Now, if he 10s Iarch, it's quite different. Uh, he doesn't join as an enemy, but if he 9s Iarc, basically mimics all these old Nerdavar characters where, like, he's an enemy, he has a killing edge, you gotta talk to him to recruit him. That's basically what he does. So I'm okay with putting him in here for now. Like, who knows when I'm getting the chance to talk about Zyhark and FE10 again. Uh, in this game, he has Killing Edge too, but this time he's very different. He's a pre-promote. He joins in 1-6. <laughs> uh, so like one chapter after you get Volug. Uh, one of the first pre-promotes that you get, but um, not any worse for it. Like the Dumb Brigade is like the really weird part where you start with a bunch of scrubs. And then almost every chapter gives you like one or two new pre-promotes until like... A couple chapters before the end, you're just like your army is filled with overpowered people promotes, and the game really wants you to use them. Like, it's a very non-traditional fire emblem experience, and you should definitely take advantage of it. You should definitely use Zyhark whenever you can, because he's just god like for part one for the most part. He doesn't kill everything. He does have problems, but offense-wise, he's very good. He keeps the killing edge, the brave sword. Um, he keeps wind edges to kill enemies sometimes, depending on difficulty and like what kind of enemy you're facing. Um, he's just so strong offensively. He does have defensive issues. He does have durability issues a little bit sometimes. Uh, you can, he does have the Earth Affinity, which will let him build supports with someone and gain like a ton of avoid for both him and his partner. A lot of people pair him with Volug or Nolan to get double Earth for like overkill avoid, which I really like for him. Uh, if you're playing like slow enough to where you can activate it, uh, kind of depends on your play style, of course. But if you can activate those, he becomes quite unhittable. The problem arises for like part three. I always find Zyhark is not very good in part three. Uh, the Lagoos you face are very accurate, even if you have the Earth supports activated. And I think reasonably you can't really assume he gets like an A support by then. Unless you play very slowly, which is almost like grinding. And then he'll be like at a B support with say Nolan. And he can go in a forest, but he will not reliably dodge Lagoos. Like he will have a good chance of dodging him, but I feel like every turn you're still going to face a chance of death. And that's very bad for Zyhark. You don't want to face chances of death. Chances of death is uh, a no-no in my eyes, especially when the maps are as long as they are in FE10. And then once part 3 comes around, he's like okay still because he, he started with a lot of XP, so he's better off than a lot of the Dawn Brigade in general. But once you get to part 4, he will usually not even make it to tier 3 in time. Uh, not on hard mode at least. Uh, hard mode gives you a lot less XP than like normal mode does, so if you've always found your Zyhark is like promoted in part 4, that's probably because you're playing normal mode. Which is fine, nothing wrong with that. But I'm trying to judge these off the highest difficulty, and in those I find that Zyhark gets quite low leveled. You can train him up again in, in part 4, there's plenty of opportunities to get XP, like the maps are basically made to get XP, and I think a lot of people do like uh, in the Yuzuka map, the swamp map, they just kill a bunch of Lagoos with him until he promotes. That's a fine way to catch him up, but usually I like to just beat the map in two turns and get to the end game already. <laughs> and then, like you have so many options for the end game, you don't really need Zyhark anyway, so the only reason to train Zyhark for the end game is if you just, or you were already planning to use him because you like him. Which is good, but it's not a valid reason to put him higher on a tier list, that's basically what I'm saying. Um, so Zyark starts off well in part 1 offensively, defensively has some issues. Part 3, no longer as good but still like serviceable, just kind of needs to watch out a little bit where he goes. And then part 4, he's uh, unleveled and needs some catching up, which is strange because he started out pre-promoted. So overall, I would say Zyark fits like around this tier somewhere. Um, I would say around this level of Usunos will be appropriate for him. Kind of strange how nobody has been in A tier yet, hasn't it? Uh, then we got Longku Awakening. Awakening, not the game I'm the best at, for sure. I've played it like twice total and never beaten it in like Lunatic Plus or anything, but I think most people play that game in like hard, maybe Lunatic overall. Um, so not too far of what most people do, I guess. Uh, Longku seems competent in Awakening. I don't know exactly how super good he can be. I just know Awakening characters can get so out of control in Awakening. You have so many ways to customize them through like skills and everything. I don't even know what exactly Longku gets through skills. I just know it's not that amazing. Uh, he always struck me as like okay, uh, like a good pair of bot to give someone some speed. But I don't remember if you can even two kill enemies. If like even if you get him like a strength pair up, so maybe the comment section can light like shed some light on that. But for the most part, I don't think he's that great. But like better than average, I guess. I'll put him like around here somewhere. Um, I hope this is fine. I have no idea, honestly. I could talk a lot about him, but honestly, I'd just be talking out of my butt, so I'd have no idea. What I do have an idea of is Ryoma. Ryoma is obviously spectacular. I would say probably better than Rutger in some games. I haven't played Birthright, 
So I can't say a whole lot about him except the fact that I just know he's very, 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 very good there. He's the best unit in probably all of Fates, uh, besides maybe like Conquest Camilla. He's just... I don't know, he's just... In Fates, it just seems so rare for a unit to be both durable, have one to range, and then thirdly, uh, have good offense to the point where they double and kill stuff. And Ryoma does all that with a weapon that has infinite uses, so that's just spectacular. There's nothing... that's like the perfect unit right there, like Rutger can't do that for sure. So Ryoma definitely stands out, and I think pretty sure that even within Birthright, that is pretty rare for a unit to accomplish. I'm sure there's more units who can do it, but Ryoma seems to pull it off the easiest. And then in my Revelation run right now, there is no question that Ryoma is the best unit I have. Besides, I, I really can't think of anyone actually. Like Xander is more tanky. I'm I'm less afraid to put Xander in range of enemies, but Xander has so much more issues doubling, whereas Ryoma just doubles everything. And sure, Xander has more like attacking power. And so does Camilla, in fact, but again, they have doubling issues. And then Ryoma just has a chance to crit or Astra every single attack he does, which... And then the Astra also increases his suit gauge, which also in turn makes him more durable a lot of the time. I just find Ryoma is the easy solution to every, every single problem that Fates ever gives you. It's just so, so ridiculously good. I don't know why they gave you this unit other than to just placate casual, play, casual players. He's just so freaking good. Yeah, there's not much more to say about him. Like, I know he has Jewels Blow, uh, plus 30 Avoid on Player Phase, I believe. Pretty good. Doesn't really need it, but pretty good. Um, his stats are amazing. He he kills everything. One to range. What more do you want me to say? He's amazing. Um, perfect unit. Probably one of the best units I've ever used, actually. So, if I ever do, like, the top 15 thing again, I might put Ryoma in there. And we have Felix. Uh, pretty much the only unit on this whole list that's never your enemy. But I guess in three houses, everyone can be your enemy, so he still kind of counts, I guess. Um, Crystal Fraudarius, pretty goddamn good crest. The best crest in the game, easily. Uh, most reliable crest, in a way, because it just activates so damn often. Uh, I like Rangor's way of saying it. It's like, sometimes doesn't add damage. Uh, it's so, so good. Um, his stats are good. His like, strength and speed are very high. He has good weapon proficiencies. Uh, he can use Brawling well, which I really like on him. Uh, more chances to activate his personal skill too. Uh, plus 5 attack whenever you don't have a battalion equipped. It's a good early game. Uh, like Soon after that, I like to give him a battalion. Just so he can build up authority. And uh, the bonuses kind of outweigh the plus 5 attack. Like at some point, you can get more attack from just your battalion. And get a bunch of other bonuses too. But I do think people sometimes sleep on the personal skill. And early on, we don't have many battalions. Or we don't have many good battalions. So it's a good idea to not give him a battalion. Then use the plus 5 attack. And you can also use him to bait enemies in maddening mode without depleting any of your battalion durability, which I found is sometimes an issue, uh, but running out of battalions. Uh, or like, having a battalion break mid-battle is kind of annoying for a lot of people, I feel like. So Felix doesn't have that, because you can't break a battalion if you don't have one. See? Easy. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Felix's stats are pretty good. You can make him almost anything you want, but most people, I think, make him either a Warmaster, or I think a lot of people, when they play the game for the first time, they might be tempted to make him like a Swordmaster or a Hero, because he says he likes swords, but... I don't think that's the right choice for him. I made him a Wyvern Rider in my first playthrough, then I made him a Warmaster in my Blue Lions playthrough, which was my second playthrough, and then I went with um, Sniper, actually, for uh, Crimson Flower Maddening playthrough, which was my first Maddening playthrough. I think as a Sniper, he can't actually activate... Um, or like, when he's using Hunter's Volley, which is what the Sniper should do, he can't activate his Crest, which sucks, but on the other hand... He was still good at like Hunter's Volume and people, and the personal skill was still pretty good when I needed it. Uh, most of the time I had a battalion on him though by that point. But I feel just like whatever you do with him, it's pretty goddamn good. You can even make him a Mortal Savant if that's what you really want to do. You probably don't, but if you want to do that, you, you certainly can. Uh, I think I like the War Master path the best because just quadrupling people with that Crest of Faldarius is just so much fun. Uh, but the Wyvern Rider obviously always works. I wouldn't say he's S tier, I think he's like a reasonable candidate to put him in A tier. I think he's one of the best students for, for sure. Like. He's not Byleth or Edelgard or any Lord, really. But he's still so goddamn strong. Um, I like him a lot. I don't think he dodges reliably, though, unless you, like, stack a Void through, like, um, Alert Stance Plus and stuff like that. So a lot of people think of him as, like, a dodge tank. That probably doesn't really work outside of, like, um, Manning mode. It does work, but not in Manning mode. Manning mode is basically my point. But generally, I think Felix is uh, pretty damn strong. So that's the tier list. Got a nice uh, little staircase going on here. A lot of people in B tier and less than C, less than D, less than E. Uh, honestly, I thought they'd turn out a bit worse for me, but I think I was a, I was a quite nice to them overall. Uh, I don't think generally these characters are very good in a tier list setting because 
they don't really contribute to like getting faster turn counts or killing enemies very quickly compared to other units like they kind of fall behind movement wise but when it comes to combat they're generally okay the lack of one to range really holds them back sometimes the lack of other weapon types kind of holds them back but that doesn't mean they're bad i think generally when people use these they are satisfied with what they get which is flashy animations good speed and good enough combat performance to where you can like work around the shortcomings a little bit. They do have those shortcomings though. I think that is very important. I think Ira in particular, a lot of people, they just they just don't want to see what is wrong with her, I feel like. Like the thing with Ira, like one more thing I want to add about her. Um, she's given the Brave Sword in a convo, and I think a lot of people just don't take it off her, even though she's one of the worst users of it, because other people can reach the enemy earlier than she can, and then use that Brave Sword to just kill enemies, which eradicates any advantage that Ira has in combat, because the Brave Sword kills everything. So if whoever is holding the Brave Sword is killing an enemy, then you want it on someone who faces combat the most. And that's not Ira, that's someone like Sigurd, or, I don't know, not Lacuses. Is that... Well, you could do it on Lacuses. you could do it on anyone really. Anyone mounted can make a better use of the Brave Sword than Ira can. But people leave it on her and then they say it's it's like, Ira's so good with Brave Sword. And I think for in the same way, a lot of the sword users here get praised for the utility of the Killing Edge when really you can trade that around. Sometimes other units don't have the sword rank for it, but when they do, you should try giving the Killing Edge to someone else, because... You know, it's not their personal weapon, so I don't think they should get, cre get credit for how good it is. Sometimes it works best on them, uh, especially if they're double attacking where someone isn't. Uh, there's certainly situations where a Swordmaster can be a very niche thing. Swordmasters are fun to use, but I think they're they're okay. They're not great. <laughs> a lot of Swordmaster fans, they say this unit is great. This unit is perfect. Not perfect, but can be pretty damn good. Thank you for watching, and I will see you guys next time. Let me know what other archetypes you want me to take a look at. Peace and goodbye.